Good gardening to you. My name is David Giles. I am your professor for the next 32 classes, starting today, every Wednesday and Thursday. To watch this live, that is 5 p.m. to 5.30 Eastern Time, 4 to 4.30 Central Time, 3 to 3.30 Mountain Time, 2 to 2.30 Pacific Time. If you live outside of the main continental U.S., you're going to have to figure it out. If you are picking up this class in Antarctica, well, you must be one heck of a good gardener and are smart enough to figure out when it runs. Each show is being recorded online and will be retained 30 days. You may go to the class website, go to recordings and watch any live class you missed during the window of opportunity. I will link the recordings at my own garden website designed for this class at professor-giles.simplesite.com listed right here. Depending on how much usage space they allow me at the website, I'll be probably posting some of these classes on YouTube if they don't fit there. I shall let you know when the time comes, but there will be no reason you cannot see every class regardless when you wish to watch it. I also keep a website with notes and print on the class. That too is posted at professor-giles.simplesite.com under class notes. Since I am giving a lecture which precludes live questions online, note the address in front of my lectern. You can address any plant questions here and I will answer them in writing or men mention them at my next class if the question so inspires me to do so. Go to professor-giles.simplesite.com and click the page that deals with class questions. Fill in the boxes and send. It's almost as easy as good gardening. You will also find a page of frequently asked questions on the site as well. I heard many of these questions while working for a nursery for many years. It does not cover everything, but it has many pearls of wisdom that may cover some of your gardening difficulties. There is also a blog page at the site so I can update coming events or just vent my spleen. I won't talk about politics, but I may comment on science as it applies to political hot potatoes and gardening. You're welcome to reply, but let's not get argumentative. My main philosophy is we are both entitled to an opinion and can be friends while agreeing to disagree. You will find me a moderate not leaning one way or the other in gardening controversies. I garden organically in part and high tech in part. I hope you will leave your prejudices at the door if you favor one camp or the other. One can always learn something from a discipline you do not strictly adhere to. The main goal of gardening is to produce happy, healthy plants. Our second goal, which is at par with the first, is not to damage our soil and water or anybody else's. Many an organic gardener may at this point say, hear, hear, and feel their method does this best. While organic gardening is usually less polluting, in many instances, it is polluting as well, and even more so than some high-tech methods. That said, however, high-tech gardening is far easier and is fraught with many types of polluting materials. One has to be wise what one uses or one is guilty of the accusations made by the organic loyalists. A hybrid of both sets of thought best protects the environment. Where either is weak, I will say so. Don't take it personally. We are all friends here. You may choose to ignore any fact I put forward. It is your garden and you do with it what you choose. If you have reason to doubt a lesson and can make a good case why I am wrong, feel free to make your case by correspondence. I have an open mind. I too am still learning this craft and have been doing so for the last 50 years. If you change my mind, I will even acknowledge your superior reason. That happened to me just last summer with my girlfriend. I helped her set up a garden and she insisted on paper and straw ground cover between the rows and around the plants. And I told her it would attract rodents. 
and before the season was over, uh, no longer block weeds. The cover would uh, keep moisture from the roots and hold in summer heat. But by July, she had a pristine weedless garden, totally thriving, while I was fighting every kind of encroaching weed imaginable. She won that argument by proof of example. So send me your best devil's advocacy and I will take your ideas under advisement. Please try to do the same with my class. I may suggest products or methods you find questionable. Feel free to research on your own. And if you find my suggestion under no condemnation by real science, give it a try. So let's get down to grass thatch. Lesson number one is my 10 rules of good gardening. Rule number one, good dirt is the first requirement of good gardening. Good dirt is defined as loam, compost filled soil with neutral pH and a non-compacted state. If the garden is for trees or shrubs, all of the above applies except you want acidic soils instead of neutral soils. Rule number two, if a plant looks sick for just about any reason, the first thing to do is feed it. 99.9% .9 of all plant problems are caused or aggravated by a lack of fertilizer. The one exception to this is if you're overfeeding the plant and you will see burn tips on the leaves if that is the case. Rule number three, know the plant's environment requirements. It is a, is it a sun loving plant? Is it a shade loving plant? Is it a place that, which evolved in the tropics or the desert or woodlands or prairie, clay or sandy soils? The closer one matches the place the plant evolved, the less care issues will come into play later on. Rule number four, know the soil and what the pH is. This is the amount of acid or alkalinity in the soil. <coughs> Excuse me. A plant in the wrong pH loses 60% or more of its ability to take in nutrients. A number seven is neutral. Going down is acidic. Going up is alkaline. Rule number five, the plant lives in the roots. The top of the plant is often expendable, but the roots are vital. The exception to this is cactus and other succulents who need little or no root to survive. They make roots, but can survive extended times without them. Rule number six, learn about the different kinds of fertilizer and what the label means on the bag or container. There are three numbers listed, nitrogen, phosphate, micronutrients or potash. But like foods for animals, there are good and bad, good nitrogen foods types and poor nitrogen food types, good potash and poor ones. You need to educate yourself for the best results. The best advertised fertilizers on the market are usually of poor quality. Number seven, learn which farming or gardening method are least impacting to the soil. Not everything organic is low impact and not everything high tech damages more than the average organic method. There are some methods in both camps that are superior. Number eight, water according to a specific plant's needs. There's food, uh, no food in water and very little in the soil. There's a minute amount of nitrogen in rainfall, but not enough to grow a healthy garden on its own. And too much water or too little water are also harmful mistakes. Number nine, learn the value of mulch and ground covers. Some plants prefer gravel or rock for a ground cover like cactus, but most want a shredded mulch to protect the roots from extremes of heat and cold, wet and dry. Ground covers can block weeds, specifically paper or plastic ones. Number 10, there's a time to every purpose under heaven, and that includes gardening. 
Know your zone and recommended plant and harvest times. These rarely vary by more than a week. You will be tempted to plant too early or forget and plant too late. Some plants do better planted in the fall. Learn when to plant or expect crop failures till you do. Perfect example of planting too late are peas. If you don't plant peas in February, chances are you'll get a nice healthy bunch of plants, but the summer heat will kill them before they make peas. You either have to plant very early or in the late summer so that you get a fall crop. To quote Lou Erickson, gardening requires a lot of water, most of it in the form of perspiration. Also on garden rules to live by, T.H. Everett said, a man should never plant a garden larger than his wife can take care of. I would suggest you take any help that is offered. And for those of you who think you have a brand thumb, Richard Dyerson once said, I have a rock garden. Last week, three of them died. We shall strive to see that that does not happen here. As I said before, good gardening starts with good dirt. This makes sense. A good foundation always makes for better results no matter what project is beginning. But what is good dirt? Is it universal? Or is one plant's uh, good dirt and other plants poison? Have I set my mind on what to grow or am I open to growing what West grows in my yard? These elements contribute to the definition of what is good dirt. But to generalize, for the most, all plants, and there are exceptions, Good dirt is non-compacted soil, nice and loose, easy to put a hoe into with organic matter well mixed. A little bit of moisture and pH appropriate to the type of plant that we desire to grow. pH is highly important and affects the ability of the plant to take in nutrients. Getting a pH test kit is helpful, and I recommend that, but there are, are other ways to tell what pH is in your area. Look at the landscape. The taller the trees, the more acidic your soil. Why? Because trees require an acidic soil. Once you climb, however, to a hyperstate of acidity, such as found in, say, the geysers of Yellowstone, then you can expect this rule of thumb to give way and you see no trees. But if you are seeing shorter trees, this means the soil is moving up from acidity toward neutral, from a 4.5 to a 5 or a 6 reading. When trees stop growing altogether in your terrain, then one usually finds grasslands and fields and prairies, if you will. This is a region of neutral pH, basically a seven, the favored pH of grasses and of soft tissue plants, the kind we grow most in our vegetable and flower gardens. When one reaches areas where grass stops growing, we have desert. These regions are alkali and register eight or even nine on a pH chart. This is an area favored by cactus and succulents. Their range of preferred pH is seven to eight, slightly alkali. When we get to a barren desert, however, like Death Valley, California, we have reached nine plus, and just like too much acid and too much alkaline, it won't grow. Things that contribute to acidity are rotting plant materials, compost and rain. So even if you lived in the prairie and used a lot of compost, chances are your garden will be somewhat acidic. To counter acidity, one uses garden limestone to the soil, either at the time of tilling or as a topical atop the garden later on. It takes about a month for lime to begin to take effect when applied topically. Thus, the best time to add lime is at the same time you are adding compost. The basic rule of thumb is, if the plants have woody stems, they like acidic soil. If they have fleshy stems, they like neutral pH. What do we expect the dirt to have in it? Well, usually when starting a garden, the soil is very hard, unless it's sandy. There are some micronutrients, but locked into the soil and inaccessible to the plants. 
Sandy soils may be loose, but they are also poor at retaining moisture or nutrients. So what one may gain in a sandy soil needs of tilling, one loses in water and nutrient retention. This next chart outlines what you do to get your soil ready for good gardening. Look it over, please. The plants already growing in a region tell a story about what needs to change to the garden. Native plants have adapted to the soil conditions and are hardy competitors to your garden. That is, unless your garden is made up of all native plants on purpose. The easiest of all gardens to grow is what I like to call a weed garden. For example, where I live, Jerusalem artichokes grow wild in the ditches. They're a, a food crop and once <coughs> I put them in my garden, they thrive. In fact, you can hardly get rid of them if you want to grow something else. No water or fertilizer is necessary, though the plant will make better tuber if given proper care. Unless you want an all natural garden of native plants, however, you're going to have to work for it a little bit harder. The minimum tools that you need are a shovel, a metal rake, a hoe, and sometimes a pickaxe. This is a little pickaxe that my son made me out of a railroad tie and metal tie bar. I find that many garden tools, when you buy them, may have a five or a 10 year warranty. You'll be lucky to get them to last one year before the handle breaks. Rather than throw away the tool, I take the head off of them and then have someone weld a handle on them like my son. Now they'll last for a lifetime. <coughs> it really irritates me when a hoe breaks right in the middle of hoeing. It means I have to stop what I'm doing and go back to the store and buy another one or have that one replaced. A rotative tiller is another good tool to own, but I've yet to find it replaces those hand tools. A rototiller can break up the soil, but does so far better if it's already loam and well spaded. I always spade and hoe before I row to till. The teller can break up the soil with more effort if I don't spade and sift through the dirt first, but the rototiller chops up weed root and I pay for it later when those roots mature into full grown weeds. So begins the arduous task of spading, hoeing, and with the rake sifting out the existing plants and roots already in place where your garden will lay. <coughs> Getting as many roots out of the soil as possible is a necessity. These roots are perennial weeds, the uber survivors of the garden, and they will outcompete anything you wish to grow. The bigger the garden, the harder is going to be the task. If it's an existing garden, it gets easier in successive years. But if it's a new garden, prepare for a lot of hard work. One way of making it easier is to do your own hoeing after the beginning of the spring rains. Clay soils are always moist and they're easier to dig than those that have been dried into a brick. Too moist, however, and they turn into a sticky, sloppy muck. You want to find that right place between too dry and too wet to dig. One wants a soil that is loam. Loam means easy to spade, full of rotting organic materials and air. What makes a good additive to, to make a loam soil? Many people like manures or rotting plants. Of these, I prefer manures, but there are some poops that are better than others. This is the cycle of food. <clears throat> this is the way nature keeps in balance. We feed trees and plants and they feed us. It is simple, but we have moved away from this principle in modern society. For example, the best manure is human waste. Oh no, you say. 
I'm not going to eat food grown out of toilet waste. It has to be dangerous and it can't smell very nice. Not necessarily. Yes, raw human sewage can carry pathogens and is not recommended. But that's also true of the poop from farm animals as well. Raw excrement is a future garden bonanza, but only if it's allowed to break down or is treated and processed first. There are companies that take waste from water treatment plants and convert them into bags of garden manure. One such company is Nutrigreen and another is called Dillo Dirt. Unless you live in Virginia or Texas, those are probably not available to you. They're approved by the FDA for all forms of gardening. They've been completely broken down and most of the smell removed, not all. <clears throat> One of course could make their own human excrement manure by letting it break down in a lagoon or holding pond or in a compost pile or bin, but you won't be popular with your neighbor if you try it. I rec recommend any manure age at least one year out in the compost before use. This allows it to break down and the pathogens to move on. The second best manure is pig, but it's purely awful as a smell. <coughs> it too needs at least one year between coming from the pig and into your garden. The third best is sheep manure. It smells far less caustic, but needs about two years to break down before use. Cow manure comes next, also two years maturing. And last is horse manure, which requires three years because it has a much higher, higher urea content. Animals that eat plants do not make as many micronutrients in their poop as do omnivores. Human or animal manure is excellent and superior to non-digested plant materials like leaves or grass clippings. I do not recommend chicken manure. It is far too high in phosphates and nitrogen and is highly polluting of groundwater and streams. This is an example, by the way, of where organic farming can be highly polluting. Just because something says it's organic does not mean it's completely friendly to nature. For those too squeamish to use animal or human manure, there are dead plant mulches. Typically, people like to compost leaves or grass clippings, but unfortunately, these reduce in volume about 95% from the state where they were first put in a pile. A huge pile of dead leaves or grass generates a tiny amount of loam. The best dead plant mulch is shredded hardwood bark mulch. Evergreen barks are too acidic except to grow trees in, and non-shredded bark mulches take forever to break down. If one mulches around one's trees every year, take last year's mulch and put it in your veggie garden when replacing it. I would recommend this even if one uses manures or of whatever animal kind. <clears throat> Let's imagine you ordered a dump truck load of aged sheep manure from your local garden center or farmer and it is dumped next to your garden. You know for certain that it's been aged two years. Three or four is even better. Spread it liberally over the entire spaded garden. The more the better. Now use your rototiller if you have one to mix it in. If you don't have a rototiller, well, it's back to the shovel hoe and the rake. Don't forget to add limestone. Now, if you can. Unless you put it in too lean, you now have an excellent medium to begin growing plants. If you do this yearly, after a while, you will have soil as loose as you see in the rototiller commercials. Until you have more manure than soil worked in, midsummer, it is still likely it will harden a great deal. Even with compost, soils compact. Other recommended things to put in the soil include eggshells for calcium. I use every shell I discard from the breakfast table by tossing it in between the rows and then crushing them with my feet. The calcium acts as a carrying agent which means once it's microscopic in size, it helps bring food into the plant root. Also wood ash from the fireplace helps sweeten the soil, making it more alkali. So if you live in most places with acidic soils, wood ash is good. But both of these are excellent organic gardening 
practices that I recommend. Do not, however, mix sand and clay together, trying to find a happy medium between too rocky and too soft. This turns into adobe brick and can create a gardening nightmare. Sand and manure, yes. Sand and clay, no. If the manure you used is not matured, it will cause the plants to have too much urea, nitrogen, and burn up. Do not use manures fresh from the animal. They must age first. You can try growing without any loam with just the soil you have. Those lucky enough to live on bottomlands near rivers or in the wake of nearby volcanoes, your soil is rich in minerals. But even there, it does not make your soil loam. It can still be hard and compacted. Those living on hillsides, deserts, beaches need loam or expect very poor results. Now, after you've got all this work done, get out your test kit after you finish prepping the soil. Your ideal pH for uh, vegetable gardening is a seven. If it is lower than that, you need to add more lime, raise the number to a seven. If for some reason you live in an area where your soil is alkali and it's reading higher than seven, put in more compost and that will make it uh, more acidic. Seven is what you're aiming for. The work involved in prepping your soil will pay off in spades come harvest. Many people tell me that they like a flat bed garden. I recommend putting in raised rows. Or if you're fortunate enough, timbers nailed into large rows shaped in boxes to bring the entire garden up to waste level. It's much easier to weed up here than it is to get down on the ground and weed on your hands and knees. Flat ground gardening uh, composts uh, compacts faster and it cuts off the air supply to the roots of the plant. I also like about two feet or more between the rows. It gives me room to work on all those problems later on, separates the plants to prevent fungus and insect infestations. Try not to overcrowd your garden. Plants, you know, they need their space too. Well, that about wraps it up for today's lesson. Look for the taping of this and other episodes at, at our class website, professor giles dot simple site dot com recordings. I will leave up the old classes for 30 days in case uh, you cannot be here for the live broadcast. Send your email questions to professor dash giles dot simple site dot com on the class questions page. It doesn't have to be about today's lecture. If you have a plant uh, troubles ask, I will help you as best I can. As it is Lent, I'm reminded of a story. Each Lent back east where I used to live, the, uh, there we went 40 days without meat except for fish and fasted. I and my friends often exchange good uh, vegetarian recipes to make the self-denial less bland. A fellow named Peter from Ireland shared one recipe called Irish bean soup. You take a couple of new potatoes Cut them up, then add leeks, garlic, rosemary, and thyme. And of course, the most important, kidney beans. But never use more than 239 beans. Well, why, I ask? Because one more bean makes it too farty. Have a good day.